Hello and welcome to our final uh, Zoom presentation for Accounting 320. I'm your host, Dr. B, and I will be presenting on the final two weeks of the course, week seven and week eight. Uh, and of course, we'll, I'll be presenting a little bit more on COSO and also a little bit more about uh, various fraud components. So, uh, just quick housekeeping notes uh, for the class. Uh, as you know, we are in the beginning of our second to last week of the course. So let's talk a little bit about what is coming up. Uh, so if you go to your course content area and you select week seven, the first thing, uh, as always, you'll have your standard weekly reading uh, discussion. You'll have your final PowerPoint presentation, which is going to be a uh, final version of your draft through, and you'll, you'll include, it's, it's, a, it's essentially a combination between your, um, your report and COSO, you know, how, how COSO interfaces with, with uh, ways of preventing the fraud that has happened. Um, and the final project report. Final project report is essentially a, uh, how do I wanna put this? It's a collection of what you've already written uh, for those first three components. And it is uh, gonna be tied together through COSO, right? And that, that's, that's kind of the idea behind the, the final project report. So as you read through the requirements, uh, Essentially, you're going to pick out like what, what is the best part of the control framework. And uh, you want to relate it back to your, your first, the first parts of the project, right? The, um, the, st the storyline and then, and then the last two parts that you did last week, uh, the, the two design components. The idea behind it is that you are demonstrating your understanding of COSO and how these components um, interface with design for preventing fraud, right? Um, it's kind of like a cohesive uh, narrative. So you, you started off by creating your, your story. Then we went to um, how do we deter it? How do we detect it? And so it's, it's basically kind of like this, this cohesive story, right? And that, that's the idea behind this final report is you're, you are looking at what you've written uh, in, in your previous reports for this project. You are connecting that to COSO and you are identifying the, basically the framework of, of what do we do going forward, right? And that, that's, that's kind of the whole concept behind, behind this course is that we, are determined to mitigate fraud at, at, at different points. Then in week eight, again, you'll have your, your weekly readings discussion. There will be a, a discussion on RPA and fraud detection. RPA is uh, robotic process automation, which is a huge uh, area of growth within the accounting world. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, in, in the presentation. And then the last thing you'll do is you'll have your very final current events report. Uh, yeah, it came back. So, so we, we started, I think, well, the, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe the first one that we did was in like week two-ish. <laughs> the third one, uh, I'm sorry, the second one was in week four, maybe? <laughs> it's, been, it's been a while, right? And, and then now here is again, right? This is the final one. Uh, so again, it should be a, a totally uh, separate, um, it should be based off the one I, and I think we already went through the process of selecting your third one uh, last week, I wanna say, I think it was week six, maybe week five, let's see. Uh, Cause I honestly do not remember, it was so long ago already. Maybe it was week five. So in week five, uh, was it week five? I know that we did it, right? Was it week four? Holy smokes, was it that long ago? No. No, it couldn't have been. 
Week three, no, there's no way. It was week three, holy smokes. Okay, so going back to week three, you uh, had selected a current event for approval. You will write your report for that current event, just like you've done for the previous two, and that'll be submitted at the end of week eight. Uh, feel free to submit it early if you want. There's, there's, no, there's no penalty for submitting things early, <laughs> okay? Uh, I just might not be able to get to it right away because, since I have a lot of, uh, of grading to do from the previous week as well. But please feel free to work at it if you're more than welcome to, uh, if that's what you want to do. And that's kind of a, a breakdown of what's going on for week seven and week eight. So let's jump into the presentation prepared for today, and uh, we'll, we'll have some fun with it. Uh, I, we, we got Danielle and we got Natasha here, so we will have some fun. Um, uh, toward the, especially toward the end of the presentation. I promise it will not be very long. This presentation might be like maybe half an hour at best. Um, but definitely ask questions if you have them uh, because it'll, it'll make for a much better presentation. Okay, so let's jump into it. So this is our final Zoom session for the course. Uh, okay, so, so the course project. Uh, so what do we have going on? Week seven, week eight, you have uh, week seven, we have the uh, PowerPoint final presentation and the fraud project report. So along with that, uh, we, we need to integrate, and I'm positive most of you have already done this, uh, in, in your presentations, your draft presentations from last week, uh, which I've, I've started looking at them. Uh, there's, as you know, we have uh, uh, 28 students in this course, so it's it's a lot to, to look through. Uh, the, the good good thing is not very long, but um, the point, the overall point to that exercise was for you to think about presentations in a general sense. How do you present the information that you've uncovered through the process of developing a case, analyzing the case, and figuring out ways to deter? Uh, we are in the process of integrating co the COSO model uh, into your overall case structure, right? Uh, and what does COSO tell us? Well, uh, as you know, it's five components utilized to, con uh, to control uh, a structure and to deter uh, fraud, right? So within this, uh, is, as I'm sure you've already read, the fraud triangle components uh, were limited. Um, actually, there's a more recent report. I don't know why we have 2002 in here. But uh, the more, more recent report uh, from the ACFE, and, it's, and I believe the percentage now is more like 51% of fraud occurs before the victim lacks sufficient controls to prevent it. So uh, how do we control the environment? Well, we think about uh, our mechanisms that we have in place. And it's not just security cameras. Uh, we're talking about the, the environment of the business, right? So you know, we, we have things like security cameras, we have process and procedure, we have separation of powers, all of these great things together to control the environment of which the business exists. Uh, in the in a previous uh, <clears throat> in the previous Zoom session, was it like two weeks ago? I gave an example of a gas station, and the gas station is the the environment, right? That's the, that's the the business. At the gas station, you have security cameras, you have process and procedure for staffing, uh, you have control measures for the. Uh, the customers coming in to and out of the convenience store. You have uh, control processes for your customers at the gas pump, safe operation, uh, all that good stuff, right? You have fire suppression systems. You have uh, mechanisms at the gas pump itself. With the credit card reader, uh, hopefully there's mechanisms in place to prevent credit card theft at the pump. So that's the, that's the idea of controlling the environment. It's, it's what are the measures that we have in place 
to prevent fraud from happening, right? A risk assessment, risk assessment tells us what are my potential risks to the business. And as you know, through a SWOT analysis that's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, we can conduct a risk assessment on the business. The risk assessment from the uh, example of the gas station is one risk is I could be robbed. Another risk is somebody could accidentally cause a fire. Another risk is uh, my employees might steal from me. Another risk is uh, you name it, right? The list goes on and on. <clears throat> we identify what the potential risks are. Look at it from a, an analysis perspective. What are the chances of these risks happening? We implement measures to prevent those risks from happening. That's risk. That's a, this is all part of risk assessment. Control activities. What are my policies and procedures in place and how do I execute them? Those are control activities. An example, let's say I have two employees working at that gas station uh, in the evening hours and in between shifts. The two employees have separate responsibilities for cash control. An example, of that would be one employee counts the till, the second employee recounts it in front of a camera to validate that amount. They, they, see, they seal the deposit in a clear bag, they both initial it, and they put it into the safety deposit box. That's a control activity. That's, that, out, that outlines the policy procedure and the execution of that policy procedure. Information and communication. This is pretty big when it comes to both internal and external communications. How do you communicate with your, with your customers? How do you communicate with your employees? What are the respective channels? You know, if something goes wrong, who do I call? Do I, do I, do I call my manager? Do I call, um, you know, do, does it, how far up the ladder does it go, depending on what it is, that type of stuff. Of course, monitoring. So, so, and monitoring is not just the idea of watching your employees, watching your customers. The idea behind monitoring is <clears throat> ensuring that the policies, procedures, and the elements within those are working correctly. That's a part of monitoring. It is my uh, policy for counting cash working? Is my process for bringing up transactions working properly? Uh, and so from monitoring, we can then go back and reevaluate, right? That's a, the that's a whole concept behind the model. So, so please make sure that you uh, incorporate that into your, your presentation as well uh, as your report, final report. Okay, so the final PowerPoint. Again, we are taking what we have written in the in the past three parts of the project. We are embedding COSO framework, right? Identifying how how the framework uh, essentially works within within your scenario. We indicate uh, what is the most imp uh, important component. Um, it's this is a little vague, right? It's and the idea behind behind it being vague is that you want to kind of explore these areas. So indicate what you think is the component of a particular value of the overall system. Are there any particular concerns that you have for individuals in applying this component? So. It, you can select one or two, you know, it doesn't have to be all five because I mean, it's, it's difficult for us to select all five and then have to elaborate on all five. It's kind of a lot, right? 
And so what I recommend that you do with respect to your PowerPoint of, you know, and it should be, it should be maybe about 10 slides thereabouts. It doesn't have to be anything longer than that. Uh, uh, try to, I mean, I'm a terrible presenter, obviously, because this, this slide is very deep. There's too many words on it, <laughs> right? But, um, you know, bullet point uh, slides would be ideal. Uh, from, from the perspective of the three parts of the project, what a lot of you have done is, you know, a couple, couple bullet points uh, for, for those three reports that you developed. Um, that's great. Uh, if you want to incorporate COSO within those slides or have separate slides for COSO, that's fine too. You know, I'll, I'll leave it up to you of how you want to develop your presentation. Um, you know, I expect them all to be different and that's, that's totally fine. You, you know, you, you all have your own styles. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not critiquing you based off of wordiness or misspellings or, the idea here is to help the reader of the presentation to understand more about COSO and how that framework can be used in different scenarios, right? And so that, that's, that's the idea. That's the idea behind it. D Danielle, Natasha, does that make sense to you all? Hopefully, yes. <laughs> yes. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, because I, I wanted to make sure that this exercise is really it's general to the sense that we could apply COSO to pretty much every scenario. And that's, that's kind of the idea behind it. So, but uh, thank you so much for replying in the affirmative. Uh, Danielle also said yes. Okay, so that's the presentation. If you have questions along the way, feel free to email me, uh, you know, or just shoot me, a, shoot me an email or, or send me a, what do you call? a message to the, to, to the discussion boards uh, if you have any questions on it. Okay, the, the report, the report. So staying on the theme of COSO and thinking about your, your case presentation and your two design components, right? And looking at how all that's connected we, we introduce COSO in a framework that is applicable to that situation or to that scenario. So we want to select the components within COSO, whether it's one or all five or, you know, however many you feel. Discuss the implications of the selected components within this, this report. It doesn't have to be long, okay? Just um, the, what, as you do your final reports, basically what you're doing is you're, ref, you're gonna refine what you've already written, condense it down, okay? Uh, and include the COSO framework within that final report. So in other words, you, you're not just resubmitting what you've already done. That's not what you're doing here. What you're doing here is you're going to select, uh, you know, what I call the good parts from those th from those three that make the most sense. Refine it based off of my feedback, and implement COSO. Right, that, that's the idea. It, it doesn't have to be perfect. I'm not looking for perfection here. I'm just looking for understanding. I'm looking for how you feel that COSO would be applicable to your case. And that's really the, the, the design behind it. So the questions could be, how does this relate to the types of fraud that you've studied during the course or within your, within your uh, presentation, your case presentation? How, do you, how does the controls you selected build a better culture in an organization. So in other words, uh, let's say I wrote my case presentation on 
uh, insurance fraud. And within insurance fraud, I've identified um, risk assessment as being the component of COSO that will be most applicable to insurance fraud, okay? How would risk assessment build a better culture within the insurance company? Something like that, right? Do you understand? It's, it's the idea of connecting COSO to your particular fraud case that you wrote about in the, in the project. How does, how does that fit within the organization? How does it make the organization better? How does it improve it? You know, again, it's all connective. So if you think about the project as a whole, you started with a case presentation, you developed a fictitious case, you know, you, you, you developed the, the, um, the framework around that. Oh, this, these are the suspects. This is the type of uh, fraud that happened. Uh, this is how they got caught. This is, this is um, you know, the charges or whatever. Then we move into uh, the, 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 the project design components, right? So now we're bringing those three elements into this final project report and bringing in COSO as uh, we're basically fitting COSO within our situation and saying, based off of what happened to the company through this fraud that was perpetrated, how will COSO, our components of COSO, improve the overall organization? How will it make it better, right? And, and that might be something as simple as, oh, well, uh, in, in a fraud situation that involves insurance, risk assessment would, would improve the overall organization because the organization will perform risk assessment on itself, identify its weak points, and uh, make modifications, right? So... I mean, you want to go into a little bit more detail than that. I'm just giving a very broad um, example, but that's that's something to think about. Danielle, Natasha, does that kind of make sense? Yep. Great. <laughs> yes. Okay. No worries. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, so so that's the and that will be the conclusion for the project for week seven. Uh, so let's jump into the current events for week eight. Okay, so as you know, it's twelve months or less. Most of you have already selected this it's based off of opinion. When you write your opinion piece, it's based off of your opinion. Okay, not not off the opinion within the the um, not with not within the opinion of the case that you selected back in week three. The case you selected back in week three is what you should be writing on. The opinion piece should be your opinion, not the opinion that's already in the case. Just to be clear on that. Okay, let's talk about RPA. Robotic Process Automation and Fraud Detection. RPA. What is RPA? What is fraud detection? Fraud detection, as you know, is the approach to detecting fraud using analytics. Within fraud detection, especially in accounting, what we look for is we look for anomalies. What looks out of place? It's, uh, what, if I take a subset of transactions, let's say I look at a day's worth of transactions at a gas station. I got 5,000 transactions that happen in one day. I look at these 5,000 transactions. Everything looks pretty much in order. Oh, this number of gallons, this price, this number of gallons, this price, so forth and so on. And then of course you have the transactions that happen with, within the convenience store, great. Everything looks in spec, right? There's nothing out of the ordinary. It's not like, oh, here's somebody who charged $500 in gas. 
well, that's kind of interesting, right? Who's spending $500 in gasoline? So that, that's an anomaly within the subset of the transactions. So you then zoom in on that transaction to understand what happened. In, in accounting, we look at parameters, right? We, we look, when we're looking at data, subsets of data, we look at the parameters. What are my parameters? Well, I, my, the typical spend on, on a gasoline purchase at a, at a gas station is, is X, right? The typical spend in the convenience store is X. Uh, the uh, amount of time the transaction took is Y. Okay, so I'm looking at X and Y from both subsets of the transactions. I set my parameters. Okay, so the average transaction for gasoline is X. I have a low and a high. You know, low being, you know, $10, high being $40, $50, right? And, and obviously this changes over time because the price of gas changes over time. But if I see a spend that's a hundred dollars, I'm like, okay, well, you know, maybe it was a truck and a boat, right? But you look at, you might want to look at that transaction and say, okay, well, that's out of outside of my parameter. And that's that's one of the methods that we take when we deter fraud. Is we look at the data, we look at the historical data uh, to help to identify potential instances of fraud. So what about robotic process automation? Because you, we can automate that process. We can, we can have a flag thrown on a computer when the parameters are breached. Robotic process automation is not just a computer algorithm picking up on anomalies. It's not just the idea that uh, the mundane transactions are replaced by a computer instead of a human. Robotic process automation is inclusive of small regular processes being automated. For example, uh, a bookkeeper commonly enters revenue and expenses into QuickBooks for a small business. The bookkeeper, it's a very manual process. You know, they, they, they're, they're, they're performing journal entries. They are uh, copying information from the purchase order and the, uh, and the bill that was received and entering it into the system. They are then cutting the check or, or taking care of the, um, EFT, right? The electronic funds transfer. It's very, very routine. These are small processes that can be easily replaced through robotic process automation. Nowadays, uh, even with QuickBooks, you can take a picture of the, uh, or scan in the invoice. The invoice automatically matches with the purchase order and you can even automate the printing of the check or the EFT of the check. This is robotic process automation. You might think that this pro th these processes will replace humans. Uh, the short answer is no, that's not the case. Uh, in often time cases, uh, robotic process automation is designed to enhance the human worker not to replace them, okay? What do I mean by that? Instead of the bookkeeper manually entering revenue and expenses and, uh, and, the, and the invoices and things like that, the bookkeeper will then focus on identifying anomalies, producing the, uh, the financial statements, analyzing the financial statements, um, and, and being taking more of that uh, CFO type of role or, or that, um, you know, controller type of role. So the idea that there's going to be replacement 
it's kind of a false nomer. I, I, I really don't believe that you'll see replacement of jobs through RPA. I think it will be a nice supplement to the human role. And so we're seeing this now, and you know, especially now since a lot of what we're doing is remote. So like, for example, you know, you don't see the accountant going to the office anymore. <clears throat> the process is being replaced uh, through RPA. Uh, everything's being done electronically. And it's not, it's not to, to replace the accountant, it's to enhance their role by helping the accountant with everything else. So there are two things about RPA you need to know. Computers cannot make judgment. They can't pass judgment. That is a human process. Computers do not have the ability to have emotional intelligence. They can't tell whether your customer's happy or not. They can tell what the transaction was, but they cannot tell if the customer was happy or not. They can't tell if your employees are happy or not. The computer doesn't have the ability to have emotional intelligence. Will it someday in the future? Probably, but that'll be a long time from now. But it still won't have the ability to have the same functions that humans can. So that's why our, the robotic process automation will never replace the human worker. It can only enhance the human worker's ability by taking care of those other processes. So I, I, th have, I think you'll see this evolution over time. Uh, in fact, the CPA exam for 2022 uh, will have RPA in it um, because of how fast growing of an area this is. The CPA exam 2022 through 2024 is dramatically changing based off of these enhancements in technology. So, so please be aware of this. This is a thing, it, you know, it's, in our class, it's only a discussion. But it's it's really something that you, you want to get involved in. And so uh, this is a discussion that happens in week eight, but it, it's it's an interesting one to say the least. And if you ever want to talk about that type of stuff, uh, de definitely I'm, I'm interested in it. I, I think that there's a lot of area for growth in this in this area. So how can RPA help us in detecting fraud? So <clears throat> Machine learning, which is it's robotics, right? It's what machine, what is machine learning? Machine learning is the idea that computers adapt to human behavior. The computer learns your patterns, right? That's machine learning. Uh, it's it's kind of like when you purchase something on Amazon, it starts recommending different options for you especially if you've purchased similar items. They'll say, hey, maybe you haven't looked at this, or hey, we're recommending this. They, Amazon has perfected the concept of machine learning. Other uh, retailers are catching on to machine learning. Uh, even brick and mortar is catching on to machine learning. But, so, so if you think about when you go to the grocery store and you, when you check out, you scan your uh, shopper's club, you know, your uh, rewards or your discount card or whatever the hell it's called. So you, you scan that and you check out. When you scan that, it's not just to get the coupons or the discounts. The store is tracking your behavior. By every time you scan that card, the store tracks your human behavior. They're identifying patterns. Every time you scan the card, they say, oh, you bought this last week. I'm going to send you a coupon for that in the following week. It's, so it's like you ever think to yourself, how did Google know I was, I was even looking at that, right? Uh, that happens to me all the time. It's like, why, are, why? Your phone listens to you, right? You, don't, you know that. Your phone listens to you. It, whether, whether you understand that or not your phone is always listening 
even if it's off, right? It's still listening. It's machine learning. It's, it's picking up on your cues. That's why advertisers are getting a lot better at advertising to you. So it's kind of like you made a search on Google for a product that you're interested in. Then you start seeing that advertisement in Facebook. You start seeing it on Amazon. You start seeing it at other websites you've been to. It's kind of freaky. Yeah, but that's machine learning. It's picking up on human patterns. How does it deter fraud? It deters fraud by identifying anomalies within that, those patterns. Okay, it uses the, the statistics and patterns to help to identify suspicious human behavior. For example, uh, if there are multiple transactions on your Amazon account that you did not make, Somebody hacked your account. It's fraud. Yeah, it's theft and it's fraud. The machines pick up on these things. That's why your bank will send you an email. Did you make this purchase? Or they'll call you. Did you make this purchase? That's part of machine learning. It's, and the machines are helping to prevent fraud by catching these anomalies within your patterns early. So that's why I brought up the, the concept of, of the uh, earlier on about the gas station, <clears throat> the, the credit card, card skimmer, right? Through the process of machine learning, your bank picked up that somebody stole your credit card information and purchased it on a, at a Walmart in a state you've never been to. Through the process of machine learning. And e-commerce is catching up on this, and they're they're figuring out ways to prevent fraud from happening by uh, two-factor two authentication at the time of checkout. Uh, by you entering your phone number and your email when you check out as a guest on their website, they're helping to deter the fraud that way. There's a lot of other mechanisms behind the scenes that even I don't know about that they're doing, right, to help prevent fraud from happening. This is all the concept of machine learning, which is a process, a robotic process automation. So it's very interesting. Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting concept. So that should be a fun discussion. Okay, now let's have some fun. So Danielle, Natasha, I'm looking uh, at both of you for a little bit of entertainment. And um, uh, a, a short six minute video, and I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Are you ready? Hopefully, you're both still listening. Ready. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> All right, let's go. Hopefully, you can hear this. Three minute video. What are the types of fraud? There are many ways to classify fraud. Fraud against a company can be committed either internally by employees, managers, officers, or owners of the company, or externally by customers, vendors, and other parties. Other schemes defraud individuals rather than organizations. Internal fraud, also called occupational fraud, can be defined as the use of one's occupation for personal enrichment through the deliberate misuse or misapplication of the organization's resources or assets. Simply stated, this type of fraud occurs when an employee, manager, or executive commits fraud against his or her employer. External fraud against the company covers a broad range of schemes. Dishonest vendors might engage in bid rigging schemes, bill the company for goods or services not provided, or demand bribes from employees. Likewise, dishonest customers might submit bad checks or falsified account information for payment 
or might attempt to return stolen or knockoff products for a refund. In addition, organizations also face threats of security breaches and thefts of intellectual property perpetrated by unknown third parties. Other examples of frauds committed by external third parties include hacking, theft of proprietary information, tax fraud, bankruptcy fraud, insurance fraud, healthcare fraud, and loan fraud. Organizations face numerous risks to their success, such as economic risk, disaster risk, supply chain risk, regulatory risk, and technology risk. Each of these risks affect organizations in different ways and to varying degrees. While fraud risk is just one of many entries on this list, it is universally faced by all businesses and government entities. Any organization with assets is in danger of those resources being targeted by dishonest individuals. And, unfortunately, a notable portion of that threat comes from the very people who have been hired to carry out the organization's operations. New creative schemes aim to stay one step ahead on mainstream thinking. The reality of the situation is fraud will never be stopped completely. To mitigate the damage, we need to study fraud. We need to make efforts to detect and prevent fraud. And we need to be on guard in our own work environment. Now that you know what fraud is, let's look at market analysis. Okay. So it's what are the... Oh, he, he, keeps, he keeps going apparently. Okay, cool. Okay, <clears throat> so... Here is a scenario. Employee at a large firm in the South is the target of a business email compromise scheme from a criminal posing as a known vendor. In other words, somebody's, somebody's pretending to be one of their vendors. They created a fake email address very similar to the legitimate vendor's email address and requested that three payments be made to a new bank account. The employee does not validate the banking change with the vendor and transfers the money. Oh, oh, that's the worst. Okay, what kind of fraud is this? What do you think? Danielle, Natasha, what kind of fraud is this? So a vendor pretended to be, uh, or somebody pretended to be one of the vendors, the employee at the company made the payment anyway by not validating a change in banking. What kind of fraud is this? What do you think? Email compromise. Scam fraud, that uh, could be. Uh, bank fraud could be. What else? What's that? What's that other one that's related to bank fraud? It's sent electronically. Here's another wire fraud. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, wire fraud. Uh, uh, yeah, that's definitely possibly probably it. <laughs> so because it, it's uh, since it was done electronically, uh, bank wire fraud is is most definitely uh, a, a large contender here. In addition to that, email compromise fraud could also be uh, it, that could be it. We don't know enough about the case to make a judgment whether it was. Uh, email compromise or our bank wire fraud. <clears throat> My suspicion is it's probably both. 
if we knew more about the perpetrators, we could probably make a really good determination. But yeah, that's uh, both of those are probably very, uh, very close. As a result of this fraud, uh, the client uh, bears the loss. You know, so so the 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 company that paid this fake vet vendor, it's too bad for them because they have to eat that that loss. Um, oftentimes, there is not a insurance for something like this. You know, companies, the, the company's umbrella insurance policy or, um, you know, possibly even the, the bank policy that they have, there's no insurance for it. So the company loses out on, on that money that's lost. So, you know, that's why it's important to kind of understand the COSO aspect. You know, what do we need to mitigate this? So, so my question, uh, next question is to Danielle and Natasha. Can you tell me what should the employee have done to prevent this from happening? And feel, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to just shout it out. It's fine as well. Verified with the vendor, yeah. Who else could they have verified with? If verify with a vendor, that's fine, but who else? What else would you need to verify something like that with? Well, yeah, with the bank, exactly. You know, because the story tells us that of a fake, uh, a fake vendor, you used a similar address to a legitimate vendor. So, I mean, obviously they're trying to pretend to be that vendor. And they set up a new bank account. Well, that's weird, <laughs> right? Yeah, so the employee should validate with the vendor and with the bank to make sure that these changes are legitimate. And clearly they weren't in this case. Yeah, exactly. So, so those, those types of things would be should be incorporated within COSO, within the company's uh, framework. So a way to mitigate this from ever happening again is that the company could set up a policy that anytime that there's a change to a bank account, for a vendor or uh, email address change to validate with the vendor and with the bank. So unfortunately that type of stuff happens all the time. Okay, so uh, here are two fun ones. <laughs> I wrote these, I you know, just made these up randomly. An employee of a bank is a teller, okay, at a well-known national bank. That same employee is also employed at, the, at that bank's competitor as a manager of tellers. Is that fraud? And then why or why not? Natasha says no. Is that fraud? Is it, is it, is it fraud to be employed in the same industry at competitors, one place you're a manager, the other place you're just an employee. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, Danielle and Natasha, you both have it correct. You said no, it's not fraud, but it could potentially be a conflict of interest. Uh, and, well, there is one case it could be fraud. And, and let me explain why. It's, it's probably not, in this case, but it could be. The way it could be is if the employee signed a do not compete clause, or if there is some type of conflict of interest where the employee is uh, getting customers from one bank to the other, right? In that case, it could be, it could be fraud. Uh, if, if the employees goes against the policy set by the, by the two banks. So, yeah, that's an interesting one. And that, ha that happens. That happens a lot. 
You know, you're an expert in the field, you're an expert teller, and you're an expert manager, okay? So, so yeah, of course. Um, so it all depends. And that's just, this is one of the reasons why it's a very important to be very clear around your policies and procedures, also within the COSO framework. Okay, uh, next question. I think this is the last question. A vendor accepts an order from a customer without a purchase order and delivers the goods to the buyer within net 30, fraud or not? It's vague, it's very vague. It depends, right? Is it fraud or not, what do you think? Fraud, Natasha, could be, it could be. Vendor accepts an order from a customer without a purchase order and delivers those goods to the customer on net 30 terms. It could be fraud, might not be. What, what, what would be your argument for fraud or not for this case? Vendor risk being paid. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's possible. Thing out, what do you think? Daniel says fraud. Why, Daniel? Why would this be fraud? Vendor accepts an order from a customer. Potential financial loss. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it depends. It depends in, in the situation here. So, so if I accept uh, a customer's uh, purchase without a purchase order and I send it to the customer anyway, I risk losing, not getting paid by that customer. Yeah. Uh, because there was not a paper trail in place. Uh, is it fraud? Um, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think it is fraud. I, th I think it's stupid on, on the company's part. You know, it's very risky. Uh, the, uh, what should the company do in order to prevent that from happening in the future? I would say make sure that every order that you get comes with a uh, purchase order. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just stupid. You know, it's it's a it's a risk on the company's part. You know, if if I accept the customer's order without a purchase order and I deliver the goods anyway, there's nothing illegal about that but it's very dumb on the company's part because the company runs a severe risk of losing uh, out financially. So <laughs> you want to take everything with a grain of salt and just kind of, you know, look at it for what it is and analyze it from, from, from a risk perspective. So, so what would, what's the risk here? We know it's financial potential financial loss. So that's where COSO comes into play. But yeah, interesting stuff. So, that leads us to the end of the presentation uh, and we're getting close to the end of class. I want to thank all of you for a wonderful semester together. I, I, I really enjoy teaching this class. This was my first time uh, teaching this class. Um, I, I know a lot about these aspects. Of, as you know, I was a financial controller for many years, uh, for 15 years. I, I teach here full time. so I. Uh, my objective is to kind of improve this course based off of your feedback. So please, uh, that leads me to my last thing. Uh, as it becomes available, please make sure that you complete the uh, course survey because that is very helpful for me as a professor and for the university. It helps us to improve the course based off of your feedback. And uh, I personally take it very seriously. Uh, it's it's a way for me to grow as a professor, and it's also a great way, a great tool for the university to improve. So, so at the end of the course, please make sure you complete your course survey. 
Uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch before the end of the course, but I just want to thank you all so very much. Uh, and I definitely want to thank Danielle and Natasha for, for attending today. It's been an absolute pl pleasure having both of you in class. Uh, I really enjoyed our interactions, both uh, through the Zoom sessions and in our discussion forums and, and everything like that. So it's just been, it's just been absolutely great uh, having you all in class. So thank you all so much. Uh, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, please feel free to email me. You can, uh, or you can reach me through the discussion forums. And I'm, I'm always going to be here from you, uh, for you, even beyond this course. Uh, if you ever need like a letter of recommendation, or you need, uh, you know, you, you're looking to work in the field, and you, you're looking for ideas, just let me know. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm more than happy to, to work with you. And, uh, and of course, I hope to see you at a graduation here in the near future, whether that be uh, virtually this December or whether it be um, in, in May, which hopefully will be in person. So, but, but again, thank you all so much and, uh, and please take care. It's been great. And I'll, I'll go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you again.